Howdy folks, and welcome to SideQuest. Now you're probably wondering, Luke, what's SideQuest? Well, I'm glad you, you asked, so I'm going to try my best to answer it. Um, for anybody who is a huge nerd, like I am, or anybody who games, or is a D&D fan, or plays any sort of role-playing game, you will know that a side quest is a mission that you go on that is not quite part of the main campaign, but is a fun little side mission where you go on and you get extra loot and extra XP. And that's what this is. This is a side piece. This is a side bonus section. Uh, mainly what I will use this for is to kind of talk about things I could never talk about or didn't have time to fit in to the main campaign which is in this case the main podcast the reason behind this is because two reasons one i i instead of if i'm only going to do this once a week the issue is with that is that i don't have enough time practicing and learning how this app works and as i keep saying i want to learn and i want to get better that's how we learn that's how you know that's how we improve Practice makes improvement, as they say. And I figured if I do this, this gives me a lot more practice, a lot more freedom, and a lot more experimental sort of experience, really, just to kind of try new things. And if it works here, then I can do it in the big main um, uh, show. And if it doesn't, then no harm done. But also, as I said, this also gives me an opportunity to talk about things I just didn't have the time for. So answer Q&A questions that I didn't have time to, to answer. Um, talk about topics or breaking news I didn't have time to add in. You know, so small little things, little side quests, little sort of chances to get more loot, get more XP, get more information and have more sort of, uh, instead of having me once a week, might have me two uh, times a week, but a lot shorter intervals and just like one big sort of um, long podcast. So that's the reason behind side quests. I think it's kind of a funny, interesting sort of name, as well as you know, it works perfectly for the being nerdy and what I'm trying to do here. So, um, without further ado, introduction over. Let's get into the news, shall we? So in today's quest, we're going to be talking about some gaming stuff, and then we're going to finish off with a bit of uh, Doctor Who news. So, let's get on with our quest. So it was announced, to my surprise, on January the 18th that Microsoft acquired Blizzard and Activision. Now, I'll be completely honest with you, I was not expecting this at all. Uh, I, If you was to tell me uh, last week that Microsoft would acquire uh, Activision and Blizzard, I would say no. Um, the simple reason uh, why is because, well, for all you guys and girls that don't know, Activision has been in a lot of hot water for about, I want to say seven years, but more than likely it's been going on longer than that. They've been having a lot of allegations, uh, sexual allegations, a lot of really cringy, horrible, uh, disgusting stuff has been going on in the workplace. And a lot of uh, the female workers there have had to, have been forced out or have had to leave because of how bad the conditions are there. So Activision and Blizzard are in a very hot bath at the moment and i went really english there sorry i was going to say hot bath but i went bath um but they're in very hot water at the moment and i'll be honest i generally thought that um all the gaming companies and the gaming industry in general would just let activision and blizzard just dissolve and just sink into the into their pit of sorrow and then just kind of scavenge the um the, the, the many, many, many studios that they own, especially Activision. Activision owns tons of studios. And I thought that's what they were going to do. They were just going to go in, scavenge, take what they want and sort of leave. But my surprise, as I said, on January the 18th, it was announced that Microsoft has acquired Activision and Blizzard for the eye-watering amount of $68.7 billion dollars right that's in, that's insane that is more than what they paid for for Be all of bethesda and zenimax right it's a, it's it's genuinely insane to me that that's how much they bought them for and to give you some perspective i believe disney bought fox for 72 billion i think i haven't got it written down i should have really re re looked into that uh, before i use that quote but it's not far off, right? It's not far off what Disney played to buy Fox. 
So it was a lot, a lot of money, you know. Um, and apparently, uh, as this story's been progressing, it turns out that Activision were actually looking for somebody to buy them and that their first choice was um, Microsoft, which, again, I'm quite surprised at because if you're a gamer, you will know that Activision has a close um, relationship with Sony and PlayStation. So whenever a new Call of Duty comes out, um, they always... Like you get the the new maps on Call of Duty first, get the new skins, get the new um, zombies map on uh, PlayStation first. Uh, it will be an exclusive, you know, or just get this extra bonus that you you can't get anywhere else, or play it the best on PlayStation. You know, all the sort of you know um, jargon that they do when they want to sell you a game, sell you a product, and it surprised me when I heard that piece of news was because it shows to me that and i would feel sorry if i was sony i would feel really really like you know quite distraught really because again you have this special friendship with this company for many many years to have the best the best um and have the most sort of um best deal really when it comes to the newer games that activision are making only to be like when they're in the doghouse when activision's going to go down their first protocol wasn't to talk to their friends their first pro, uh, protocol was to go to uh, Sony's competitor and be like, you want to buy us? And Microsoft has got a, a lot of, and I'm going to swear here, a lot of fuck you money. You know, they've got a lot of money where they can generally just be like, yeah, okay, no problem. You know, uh, Microsoft is a trillion dollar company. Sony's still billion. And it's still a lot of money, yeah, but when it comes to buying Sony like Activision, I think... Me personally, there's no news on this, so this is me just thinking off the top of my head. More than likely, it was like Activision knows that they're going under and a lot of people might not want to buy them. And that they're more likely to, if they go to the, the company that has the most money, they're more likely going to get more for their company than they would if they went to a company with less money. Because, again, you go to uh, Microsoft, that's a trillion dollar company, and you go, you can buy us for, say, 90 million, 90 billion. And Microsoft's like, no, 60. And he's like, what about 68? Microsoft's like, yeah, okay. You know, I'll pay that. Whereas if you go to Sony, who's not worth as much, you potentially could go, well, I want, you know, 90 billion. We could only afford 20. And then Activision's like, well, I don't really want to sell for that much. You know, so maybe it's that. Maybe it's just a money thing. Maybe it's like, well, we've got to make a win as much as we can because nobody wants us. We'll go to the, the biggest gaming company, which, um, you know, with the most money, which is Microsoft, and we'll ask them. And we're more likely to get more money. So potentially that's it. Obviously, that's there's no news on that. That's my personal opinion of what I think happened with my knowledge of how gaming uh, works and how the gaming industry works. That's potentially uh, as to why they went for it. But again, I'm quite surprised that Microsoft would buy them because of all the hot water that they're in. But I am a big believer. I'm a very firm believer as well that with Microsoft buying um, and acquiring Activision, I feel like they will fix all the issues that Activision had. Um, like get rid of all the people that, you know, all the disgusting people, all the people that were doing all of the groping and all the horrible nastiness. I don't really want to get into because it, it's not pretty, but you can Google it and it's it, it's all over the internet. You can find it quite easily. But all these really bad people, get rid of them. Get rid of uh, Bobby Kopeck, who is the CEO of Activision Blizzard. Get rid of him. Put in new management, which they are. They're putting in Phil Spencer, who is the head of Xbox, who now is actually the head of Microsoft Gaming completely. He's the CEO of it all. And they'll be answering into him, which is fantastic. And I feel like this would be good for the gaming industry. You know, we're going to get more games. You know, all the companies that have basically been strangled to death by Activision of like, you must make COD, you must make COD, nothing but COD, can now, you know, that the... the, the proverbial virtual hands have been taken off the of these gaming companies throats and being like it's okay you can breathe daddy xbox is here to look after you you can make whatever game you want you never have to do cod ever again you know so for me as a gamer it's fantastic for the gaming industry it's even better because this means that we're not just going to get drivel because i went off cod a long long time ago i really did because cod just became cookie cutter you know it became a clone it was like fifa it was the same thing every year 
You know, and sometimes the graphics didn't even improve. You were still using the same engine from two, three years ago. You know, it was very like, oh, hound it in. And I went eventually went to Battlefield, which, as we can see now, Battlefield's doing really, really bad for themselves. So that's, you know, not a good sign at all. But the point still remains is um, this is a good thing for the gaming industry, you know. And you, what you have to imagine, it's not the headlines go Activision Blizzard. It's not just Activision Blizzard they're taking. Like I said, there's more companies. You know, there's Raven Software, who, um, you know, who made Singularity, which is a fantastic game. They made um, the Wolfenstein 2008 um, game, which is pretty good, underrated. You know, you've got Beanox, who did Spyro, the remake for that. You've got Toys for Bob, who did the two amazing remakes. Well, the first remake collection of Band Crash Bandicoot and uh, Crash Bandicoot 4, you know. There is Treyarch, um, there is Infinity Ward, and Demonware, I believe. Like, there's loads. Like They've not just acquired Activision, they've acquired every Activision company that they own, whether they've had them and they've dissolved them, but they still own the IP. So like Sahara, the people who made um, Time Shift back in like 2006, which is, again, another underrated game, but like was a deal really get the love it deserved. Um so this is incredible. Like we can bring back Prototype, you know, Prototype One and Two, incredible games. I again, I missed out on them growing up, but I remember them very vividly because I had friends that had them and they were telling me all the amazing things you could do in them. And I used to go over and used to, uh, when I used to have a, used to go to my friends' house, used to play it all the time, and it was incredible. So we can bring Prototype back, and you know, uh, Blizzard, you know, with, with them having really uh, horrible issues with um, Diablo again. You know, we can fix the issues with Diablo and Diablo can come back in strength. And, you know, they own World of Warcraft now. They own uh, the King, the people that make Candy Crush. So honestly, yes, they've spent $68.7 billion, But just on the mobile stuff alone, mobile gaming is, people don't realize this, is a, is a billion dollar industry. Mobile gaming makes more money than Microsoft and Xbox do combined. You know, they make a lot, a lot of money. Right, and Microsoft as it now owns King, who is one of the biggest ones. Again, they make Candy Crush and loads of other games. Right, they also now own World of Warcraft, which pulls in tons and tons of people, as well as StarCraft, as well as all the other things that Blizzard has, uh, and any of their online services that they run. Again, Microsoft now has them, so they would make their money back just on them alone. Forget about the other companies. So they're going to make their money back, and it's a win-win. And also, if you're an Xbox fan. Game Pass. Game Pass is now going to be flooded to the brim with Call of Duty, uh, Diablo, again, all of the older Xbox 360 games. You know, as a Game Pass subscriber, this is fantastic news for me because I want to play the old Call of Duties, the Call of Duties I s missed out on because I stopped playing after Ghost. After Call of Duty Ghost, which if you played it, you know how bad it was. After playing that, I was like, you know what? Screw this game. I'm going to Battlefield. And I went to Battlefield 4. And I haven't looked back since. Now, in recent months, I have, kind of. I've been going back and I've been playing the older games to kind of see, since me jumping off, how they've improved, where they've improved. You know, if is you know, mo I don't want to play the online. It's, I'm mostly playing for the campaign. And if I'm being completely, completely honest, it's mostly for the easy achievements because I'm an achievement hunter. But we'll get on to that another day. The, the point is I'm trying to make is the fact of... Co the problem with Activision among many, is that they're a lot like Nintendo where they don't drop the price of their games. They don't, they they just, all their games, even like, if you go on the Microsoft store and you go to buy, say, Call of Duty 2, which came out with when the 360 came out back in like 2005, 2006, that game is still £20 digitally. Whereas I could go to CEX, which is a store in the UK, which is like a second-hand store. I could go there and I could probably get it for 10p, Right. So why should I pay more for the digital version for a game that's old? And it's the same with all the other um, uh, Call of Duty games. Uh, they're still really high in price, and no matter how old they are. And it's, it's, it's very scummy. It's very disgusting. And as a collector and as somebody who wants to play these older games, I am not willing to spend um, upwards of... I think if I believe it or believe it or not, I think Black Ops 2 that I want to play because I missed out on it is... 34, 35 quid on the Microsoft store, um, which is ludicrous considering that game was like 2010, 2012, you know, a long time ago. 
Um, so hopefully, you know, those old games are going to be put to Game Pass and that we can, you know, exploit people like me who wants to play them but doesn't want to play out the nose for old copies or even having to pay out the nose for digital copies, you know, can experience these games. So it's really good for the industry. One of the things that kind of I wasn't shocked about, but I was also kind of um, interested in, a couple of days later, it was announced that um, Sony their stock fell by 13%, which doesn't sound like a lot. But like I said, Sony is a billion dollar company. So 13%, what that pans out to is that they their value dropped by $20 billion. That's how much in stock they lost. Twenty As soon as it was announced that Microsoft had acquired Activision, their stock, like Sony stock, went down $20 billion, which is insane but also you have to imagine on sony's part of like we've just lost 20 billion and we're going to potentially lose more so sony released a statement saying that they they basically pray and hope that um microsoft sticks to the multi-deal um contract and that they release call of duty and other games onto their system because they know that if because Microsoft now, like, they don't own it. The rights haven't been gone in yet. I don't think the, they, they actually probably own it until next year. I'm not really sure. They haven't really set a date yet. But until that deal is signed, until that piece of paper is signed, it's not properly official yet. But it's still, it, it is because it's, tra- it's in transition. But if when Microsoft get full access, if they want to and go, you know what? Every single Call of Duty that is going to ever be made is going on Game Pass exclusive to xbox sony can't do anything about it it's microsoft's ip it's microsoft's company they can do whatever they want with it and sony can't say nothing and sony will lose a lot of money so phil spencer came out it was he came out yesterday and basically said that he's had chats with sony he's promised them that he will stick to the multi um multi-platform deal which basically means that you know cod won't be xbox exclusive cod will come out on um playstation as well but which i'm quite i'm glad because phil spencer's a very good decent guy he knows what he's doing he's very clever he's he's ran xbox very fantastically he knows what he's doing in that respect so i'm not surprised that he came out and said this but at the same stage i'm like i wouldn't it wouldn't have surprised me if microsoft said no it's exclusive now Again, I would have, I could see where PlayStation fans come across and be like, that's not fair. But it's business, you know, it's the way it works. But Phil Spencer, he's a good guy. He's 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 not all about Xbox. He's about gaming in general, and he wants to improve the gaming industry. And he knows that doing something like this will improve it, will improve Activision, will improve the working climate, for not just for them, but also prove to other companies, you fuck about, you're going to learn. You know what I mean? It's, you're going to find out what happens. And, you know, that's simply what it is Microsoft's coming in and being like, you know, we're going to solve this out. We're going to fix everything. And we're then, you know, we're going to relinquish all of these other smaller sort of companies like, um, you know, High Moon Studios, Toys for Bob, Raven Software and all that jazz. And we can be like, you can make new new IP. You can make new things. You know, you can do whatever you want. And again, for the game industry as a whole, that's fantastic. That were granted like I said, Microsoft could say any new game that any company of that we own makes could be exclusive to us. They could do very easily. Um, I don't think they will, but you probably get one. You probably get a few that probably be like Call of Duty's multi-platform, but the brand new, I don't know, a brand new say prototype, prototype three, or the reboot of prototype is a Xbox exclusive. It hasn't been announced yet. I know I'm just using prototype as a um, example um but they could do very much so so i'm interested to see what happens there. i'm interested to see what they do there um like time would tell like I said, it, it was released a couple of days ago it's still in process still going but as of now things have seemed to have calmed down but yeah i'm just um i'm shocked generally when i found out i was pacing my living room um just shouting like wtf 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 because i just couldn't believe it you know it's it's not something that i generally thought would happen i thought that you know microsoft had more chance of buying sega or more chance of buying or acquiring ubisoft than i did ever them ever think about acquiring activision blizzard and everything they own um but this is good this is really really good what i hope like i said what i hope to come out of this is that we get more sort of games i hope that you know they that 
Microsoft and Activision re um, reimburse, what well, reimburse, reinstate their old licenses with Hasbro, and we get a next gen Transformers game. I love the Transformers games that High Moon Studios did with Activision. Um, so I, you know, I kind of hope that they redo the license and we get more like Transformers games. You know, I hope to get another prototype. I hope to get like a Singularity Two, Time Shift Two. You know, uh, more exclusives. I, the, genuinely, like if I was working at one of these companies now and I heard this, I would be so happy because I'm like, I can, I can finally breathe. I can finally be creative and do something that is not COD. And uh, that must be so freeing to the developers. It must be so be like, I can breathe. I can finally do what I want. This is great. You know, thank you, Daddy Xbox. <laughs> um, you know, so um, I, what do you guys think? What what are you guys' opinions are on it? Do you like uh, what? Let me know, obviously on on Twitter what you think. Um, I'm I'm shocked, and I'm still shocked, but I'm think I generally think this is going to be a great deal for the gaming industry um, moving forwards. I really, really do, and I think it just shows to a lot of all the other companies of like, you know. Not just that Xbox is serious, not just that Microsoft is, is serious about what they're doing, but they're also wanting to improve everything for everybody. It's not just improving things for Xbox, it's improving things for everybody. And hopefully people will see this as a time of change and a time of like, you know, the disgusting practices that have been going on in, in, in companies of like, hopefully will now end. So we can only hope, so fingers crossed. So anyway. That's that story. On to the next quest. And on our next and final quest to collect our loot and to get all the XP that we can so we can level up and go take out that barbarian is Doctor Who fans are charged eye-watering £220 to meet and greet with Jodie Whittaker uh, the 14th Doctor at London Comic Con next month. Uh, when I read this, I I laughed. I did uh, because the idea that right, I I'm not one when I go to conventions to pay to meet somebody. I don't care who it is. Um, I don't. I wouldn't pay to meet somebody, no matter how much I love them. And I've got a cool little story about this, and I'll come back to the article. Um, I went to Comic Con uh, before COVID, uh, around uh, I think it was around the beginning of 2019, and um, they had all almost all of the cast of, of Game of Thrones there, as well as Umbrella Academy. And a friend of mine was a big sort of Umbrella Academy fan, and they were going to pay I think 35 to about 60 quid to have to meet them to have a photo. And I told him that they were crazy, and Still to this day, I think they are. And we go down, we're in the convention, walking around, and we finally get to the really back of the convention where all this is happening. And there's just a swarm of people. Like, imagine that. Like, COVID, nowadays with COVID, like, you can't imagine that. But, like, back in the day, people used to get really close to each other, especially at conventions. Conventions, this is why people get ill, why you get the convention funk, because people don't know about personal space when it comes to conventions. And so everybody's just coughing and sneezing and like rubbing up against you. It's one of the things I don't like about going to Comic Con or any sort of convention like that is because people just don't know how to, you know, personal space. Hopefully now COVID people have learned, but people still haven't. But that's a completely different topic. Um, so there's all these people bunched up. And in the far distance at the very, very back are the sort of celebrities in their little cubicles and like taking photos and signing stuff. And um, I remember clear as day. You've got all these people in, in front here, right at the back. And then if you turned around, there was the stalls. And now I was at the stalls and there was a big guy selling old comics. And I was flicking through the Punisher and I was flicking through a Venom, just having a look around. And a friend of mine went, oh, my God, oh, my God, oh, my God, oh, my God, look, 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 it, it's, it's Dickon, Dickon. And I was like, oh, OK. So I turned around and I was like, oh, there he is, the guy that plays Dickon. And then he's, he plays, I don't I don't watch Umbrella Academy, so please don't butcher me. But he plays the really big buff dude in Umbrella Academy, and it, like, as well as like Game of Thrones. I was like, oh, cool, there he is. Oh, cool. And my friend, and like, I could see all of them. I could see, you know, um, all the people 
that was we played different characters in shows. And I'm like, okay, well, they're real. And it's not that I wasn't excited. It wasn't that I was impressed. Like I was, like Jeremy Young, you know, I'm a big fan of Game of Thrones. I was like, oh God, look, it, it's it's that person. But I, again, it comes in me being very spiritual. It's, it's I'm very much like, um, how can I explain this? <laughs> I'm very much like, I am more on a, I'm more than happy just to know that I lived when these legends lived, you know, like for example, I, it, it still upsets me and pains me that I never got to meet Robin Williams or that I never got to meet Steve Irwin, but um, I am blessed and I am honored to know that I was alive when they were alive, that I was able to experience them while I could, you know, and if I ever got to meet them again, I would break down. I'd be, you know, a fan. I'd be upset. I'd be, you know, it, a, a child again it'd be the same if i met michael sheen or david tennant i would just break down and be like, oh my god you know what i mean but would i pay to see them i don't i know i wouldn't because i would rather meet them like have the excitement of potentially maybe live it going through my life going through my adventure my story my journey and potentially meeting david tennant on the train meeting david tennant on a plane you know, go. You know, at, at that <laughs> that rhymes. Um, would you like him here or there? No, I'm not going to Doctor Zeus. But you know what I mean. Like potentially meeting my hero, somebody else, while I'm just going through life. You know, while our paths, you know, cross. Um, I met Andy Circus by accident. Generally, I was at a convention that he was at, and um, I went to the toilet, as you do, in at a convention. As I've come out, of the, the he's walked right past me and he's gone. Excuse me, mate. I was like, oh. No problem. Again, it was just a small interaction. It wasn't like shake his hand, meet him or anything. Like generally, the guy needed a toilet, you know, so I'm not going like, to, you know, get in his way. But I was like, oh, yeah, cool. No problem. And I was like, oh, that, 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 was, that was Gollum. Uh. And I had a big smile. And even though it was like a quick two second intera interaction, he doesn't even remember me. He, he, he doesn't even know I exist. I'm just a guy that was in his way as he was trying to take a dump, you know. Um, but for me, it was incredible. It was like, you know, it made my day. Like the rest of the day, no matter what happened, it was like I'm Andy Circus. It was cool, you know. And that's how I am. Like I would rather go through life knowing that I might potentially meet them. I don't want to force it and be like, oh well, I'll pay to meet them. You know, no matter how much they charge, I just I don't. I just I just don't do. It. I don't like. I'm not one for autographs as well. Like if I met a celebrity, I would. If they said, oh, do you want a picture and um an autograph i'll probably say no to the autograph i would rather have the picture but if i'm being honest what i would really prefer instead of a picture an autograph would be just a conversation you know what i mean like jim carrey's one of these guys where like when he meets fans he doesn't take photos and he doesn't sign anything if he meet if you meet jim carrey out in the in, out in the out in the wild the wild jim carrey um he instead of saying oh let's have a photo or let's um you know sign something he goes how are you? What's your name? You know, what do you do? Where, where, you know, uh, have you, are you just visiting? Do you live around here? You know, he, he wants to know you as a, as a person, as a human. He wants to have a chat with you. Um, and I've heard loads of stories of people who've met Jim Carrey and like expecting, you know, to sort of get a photo. And he's, he said no, but he said, I'm more than happy to sit and have a conversation with you, answer questions if you have any. You know, and I think that's really nice. And I think if I was ever a celebrity, I'd probably be the same. I'd probably just be like, well, no, you can have a photo. You can have an autograph if you want. But, you know, we could sit down and have a, you know, have a chat instead. Because I feel like I, me personally, I would get more out of just saying that, yeah, I sat down and I had a chat with Jim Carrey. You know, I don't have any sort of photos or I don't have an autograph to prove that it happened. But I know it happened. I lived it. I experienced it. For me, that's worth more than an autograph. For me, that's worth more than a photo. You know, so that's a very, really personal, cherished memory of mine that I can keep. But that's, but that's me. Some people, though, they, they will pay out the nose money to meet celebrities, to meet who, who you know, people who they idolize. And I'm not, again, I don't want people to think that I am taking the piss out of those sort of people or that I'm making fun out of those people. No, not at all. Um, if you want to do it, then in all fairness, do it. It's just not something that I, I do. It's not something that I, um, I do personally because I just, I just don't, I would rather have that chance of meeting them in real life. But when I read this, I had to laugh because the idea of how much it is, you know, it's a lot of money. I, I get, you know, 
she is the 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 current doctor. Well, she's not anymore, but she is the current doctor until we find out who the new doctor is. Um, but I even I th- I think my friend told me even David Tennant is I think to to have an autograph of David Tennant I believe it's about thirty five quid. Actually, tell you what, I'm going to Google it. I got my tablet. I'm going to Google it. How much? How? Hold on a second. I can't spell today. How much to meet David Tennant? All right. Uh, David Tennant. David Tennant. All right. You're not giving me an answer. I can't find an answer. But I remember a friend telling me that when they met David Tennant, it was, I think, 45 for an autograph. I think it was 60 for a photo. Um, I'm not sure. Again, that was a long, long time ago. Prices might have gone up and prices might have changed. But I've spoken to other friends about this when I, when I learned about this. And they all said, like, majority of the time when you go to meet a celebrity at a convention, um, it's dependent, unless you pay for both, it's usually under 100 quid to meet and autograph or photo with a celebrity it's never over 100 you know and to read that and, and to see how much it is i was i was gobsmacked but at the same stage there are people out there who will pay 220 pounds to meet the doctor um you know but i wouldn't i just don't i just i'm just shocked really like i was like for example two days ago no yesterday Yesterday, it was um, Tom Baker's birthday. Now, he's my favourite doctor. Of He's my favourite classical doctor. My favourite modern doctor is David Tennant, obviously. Um, but I've never met any uh, either David Tennant or um, Tom Baker. But I really want to meet Tom Baker. You know, he was 77 yesterday. Well, still is, technically. <laughs> and um, I'd, love to, I'd love to meet him. And a, a lot of my friends have met him. And majority of them met them met him by mistake, you know. Again, have met him on the train, you know, not even at conventions. And apparently, he's a really lovely, sweet man. Um, but I really would like to meet him, and I think he would probably be the only celebrity that I would pay for to meet, mainly because of he he's like I said, he's seventy seven, and I don't want to get morbid. I don't want to get quite depressive, but it does scare me. He's getting older, and I haven't met him yet, and it's just that worry of like. I want to meet him before he passes because, you know, it, it, it would really destroy me if he was to pass before I could meet him. And um, so I think he would probably be the only person that I would pay to meet. Um, but apart from that, I, I just wouldn't. And it's, it's, I just, I don't know, you know, my, for me personally, I wouldn't pay it. But like, what, what, what about you guys? Uh, would you pay £220, not just to meet Jody? Not just to meet the uh, 14th Doctor, but would you pay £220 to meet your hero, to meet somebody like Dave, like, for example, Johnny Depp? You know, if you had the chance to meet Johnny Depp or Brad Pitt or um, Leonardo DiCaprio, but you had to pay £220, would you pay it to meet them, to spend all of two minutes with them, you know, having an autograph and um, maybe having a photo? You know, let me know, you know, like, message message me on Twitter, you know. Tell me if you would. Me personally, I wouldn't, but somebody out there must because that's why they're charging this huge amount of money. So who knows? Anyway, that's that. On to the next and final adventure. And finally, the final, final task of the journey is the Q&A. Now, I did this yesterday. Um... But I ran out of time, so I wasn't able to properly answer the questions and I ended up having to leave a question out because of it. Um, so I just wanted to take the time here. Pardon me. Got to hydrate. Um, just wanted to take the time here to fully answer the, uh, the Q&A sort of questions um, that people sent in. So the question that I partly answered yesterday was, what was my favourite book growing up as a kid and why? And obviously I explained yesterday, if you listened, that um, growing up being dyslexic, I didn't really have sort of many... Uh, I, I, I didn't read when I was younger, pretty much. And that uh, now that I'm older, um, I have a new love for it because, you know, it's something that I can do. Um, but I wanted to kind of go into that a bit more deeper. Um, 
as I said on the first ever podcast, first ever episode, that I am dyslexic, that I have dyscalculia, that I have dyscalculia, basically means um, I'm not very good at English, not very good at maths, and I'm a bit wonky. Well, when I walk, you know, not I, like I, I can stand up straight, but I drift when I walk. I, you know, it's about coordination and stuff like that. Um, but I only really found out that when I was 18, when I was at my final year of college, when I was finally di- diagnosed, that's when I was sort of given like the, these titles. But growing up, it was something that I was always told that I had like dyslexia. Um, but with never any proof, I never got any proper support from school. So it, it was a bit of a, a, a hassle, a bit, a bit difficult. Um, but it's something that I've overcome. It's it's I've always seen dyslexia and all these things as a superpower. I've always seen it as like you know, like I don't want to. I'm not calling myself a god, but nowhere you read old Greek tales, and it's always like you have the hero, but the hero's always being given, um, smited down by the gods because uh, they are given a handicap, they are giving a disability, they are giving they are being given something that is going to um, stop them from completing their quest and overtake the gods. That's how I like to think about it. I like to think of it, I've been struck down with this so-and-so disability of a learning disability that I can't succeed at life. I can't do things. And it was the same that I had from school when I was in, um, when I was in primary school, you know, schools are different now. But when I was in school, you know, teachers were harsh. They were like, you're the stupid kid. You're the idiot. You're not going to succeed. You are um, not going to do well in life. You are going, the best job you'll ever get is working as a bin man or working at McDonald's. Well, there's nothing wrong with working at, working at McDonald's. But when you're a kid and being told that, it's like the worst thing in the world of like, you're not going to succeed at all. You're not even going to get get into college. This is what I was told by teachers, you know. Obviously, schools are different now, but, you know, I had some really mean teachers when I was in primary school. You know, not all of them, just, you know, when I was mostly in nursery and year one, year two. Um, but I always, I'm. it sounds weird, it sounds backwards, even though it was not very nice to, to be told these things and you should never tell kids these things. In a way, I'm quite glad that I was told them because my natural reaction when I was told these things as a child, and even now it's the same, was, you know what? No, I'm going to prove you wrong. I'm not going to listen to you. I am going to succeed. I am going to go to college. I am going to go to university. I'm going to show and I'm going to prove to you and I'm going to prove to everybody else that I can do this, that I can do whatever I want to do. I'm not stupid. I'm not dumb. Just because I have a learned disability does not mean that I can't do something. And I've always... So in a way, I'm glad that I was told these things as a kid. Again, you should never, I'm not saying that you should, but for me personally, it worked. You know, for me, it was like, okay, I'm going to prove you all wrong. And I did. I worked hard. I, you know, pushed myself to learn to read. I like, it, like I got help from my, my friend of mine. Um, his name was Nassib. He helped me fantastically with reading, but also when I was at home, I used to pick up magazines. I used to pick up anything that was written down and I would just read it just so I could improve at reading, you know, just to kind of prove to, to teachers that I wasn't stupid, that I wasn't dumb, that I could do it. I just needed to, you know, push myself. And it, that's basically what it's been like, really. It was like I I, I got decent grades in senior, in senior school, high school, if you live in America. Uh, I went to college and I did really, really well. Um, I was the only person in my class to get the extended diploma in IC, in level three ICT. Um, I got student of the year. I worked really hard. I did my work experience and I got invited to a really fancy um, £150 dinner at a really posh like, tuxedo sort of event, the most fanciest place I've ever, ever like party I've ever been to in my life but I got invited there because of how hard I worked with my work experience you know um I went to university I did two years university you know but after the first two years the um tutor basically said to all of us in the class of like you know you're all doing so well do you want to you know instead of just doing the the game design course would you want to go for the full um um bachelor's degree um in science but that would take another two years and we were like 
well, if if you think that we can do it, then we must be able to. So we we all sat and agreed, and so yeah. So for the next two years, we changed, and then we went to doing the bachelor's degree, and I got my bachelor's. You know, I've got a bachelor's of science. I if I wanted to, I could do do my master's in anything. You know, I'm I'm actually thinking about doing a master's in English literature. I know I'm dyslexic, and I want to do a master's in English literature in creative writing. You know, and I mean, it's it's insane. I know, but it's all because I had the determination to push myself. You know, so as a child, yes, I couldn't read, but I I see reading and I see literature as a gift. I see them as a gift that humans gave to each other to express ourselves. You know, it was it was a chore when I was younger. It's something that I couldn't do when I was younger. And I was told that I was younger, that I couldn't do certain things. And I pushed myself to do them. And um, I now see reading. I now see literature as a gift. I see it now as a um, a way to express not just myself with my own writing, because I want to be a writer. I, I'm currently writing my own book. But also it's it's a way that I can relate to other human beings, either currently alive or since dead. You know, I can jump into their minds and I can jump into their worlds. And I I I just because I'm basically rehashing what I'm saying, but it's more so the fact of because I now see how beautiful the English language can be and how how not just the English language, but how beautiful words can be and writing is that I now have a deeper appreciation for it and a deeper love for reading. Um, so I, I, I just love it. I, I do. I, I, I read 200 books last like during 2020, the, the first lockdown, I read 200 books last year. I read a hundred and I want to say 180, but I believe it was 176. Um, I'm not really sure, but you know, I've read, I, I read constantly. Like when I'm not doing this, I either have a book in my hand or I have a audio book in my ear. You know, I'm constantly always surrounded by stories because I, I'm doing what I missed out on doing when I'm younger. You know, like when I was younger, I had friends that were reading um, Percy Jackson, Terry Pratchett. Um, they were reading um, the, oh, what was his name now? Uh, Alex Ryder, the Alex Ryder books. Um, I'm not really into Twilight, but people reading Twilight, Harry Potter, stuff like that. And I wanted to get involved. And my, my friends were talking about it in class. I'm like, oh, God, did you, did you on this chapter and this thing, again, I was just going off the movies. I didn't know what was going on in the books. And obviously the books were way ahead than the films and people were saying spoilers and I wasn't even realizing it, you know, and that was because I couldn't sort of connect. So even now as an adult, I'm, I'm 23, soon to be 24. And I am going back and I'm reading the books that I missed as a kid. So I'm reading children's books. I read the whole collection of Winnie the Pooh and I loved it. I've read Winnie the Willows. I've read all of Chronicles of Narnia, you know, I'm really enjoying it. Like I'm generally just, enraptured by these worlds that I I probably would have enjoyed more as a child but even now as an adult that I can appreciate them more and I can understand them better because I have an adult's mind that I can really relate to them really really well and I can just dip into them worlds really easily like Roldar I sat and read all of Roldar's books you know and I loved it and I enjoyed it I was giggling I was laughing you know Willy Wonka is a creepy guy it's a creepy story Chine Chaka Factory but as a kid it's it's fantastical you know, but as an adult, it's this is this guy's a creep. I wouldn't let my kids around him, <laughs> you know. <laughs> but I can see, you know, you know, where Gene Wilder and Johnny Depp they just went the next psychopathic level. But even so, you know, uh, I just have a deep appreciation for reading now, and I still struggle. You know, I still have my issues. Like I can read to myself quite easily, but um, reading out loud, I do get uh, confuddled confu and. Um, messed up at times um, especially if I know somebody's listening to me or somebody's watching me read out loud then I, get, I make even more mistakes because then I start to think about people hearing me people seeing me um, it, I was better at it at school because when you're at school you have to like you know oh Luke can you can you read from the book it's your turn now and obviously re repetition of doing that constantly I got better at it but obviously since leaving school I don't have to read to anybody read to my I can read to myself that I sort of um, I don't have, I don't speak out loud, so I kind of lost that skill. But eventually, if I ever do have kids, it's a skill that is going to come back because I will read to my kids and I will make sure that they are surrounded by books and not tablets. But again, that's a different topic. That's a different question. The point is I'm trying to make is the fact of, you know, even though I didn't 
enjoy it when I was younger, that when it was a chore, I have now grown up to appreciate it and enjoy the English language. And it is something that I'm going to carry on with me until I die. And again, with my children and their children and their children. So books will never be dead around me. As long as I'm alive, books will be too, you know. So hopefully that answers that question. Um, the next question, that is a book related question. Um, and it's one that I'm going to have to do a bit of explaining um, <laughs> uh, as best as I can. So the next question is, um, what do I make between Carmilla and Dracula? Now, for those of you that don't know, um, because most don't like, don't worry if you don't, because most people don't know. Um, and there's a reason behind it. And I will explain it as best as I can. Um, so Carmilla was written 27 years before Dracula. And Carmilla, it, it really is the first introduction in literature for vampires. Um, but it doesn't get as enough love as as much credit as Dracula does. And um, the reason behind that is because when it was written, um, well, when books were written back when Carmilla was written, which was I think it was around about 18... I want to say 1827, Carmilla was written, I believe. Um, don't quote me on that. I'll have to look that up. But it was around, it was around about the 1800s, around the beginning of the 1800s. And books at that time, you really didn't have female leads. It was mostly you know male-led stories. And female-led books were mainly not taken seriously. They were only really read by women. You know, um, men didn't take them seriously. And that they were shunned. But also, the, the, the thing with this book is that it's not just a female-led story. You you have the two female characters. You've got Carmilla and Laura, and Carmilla and Laura they have a romantic relationship. They have, um, you know, a sexual relationship, a bond, you know. And nowadays that's not an issue. You know that nowadays you have books with that in, and it's fine. But you have to imagine back in the day when that was written, it was uh, same sex. Um, coupling was frowned upon immensely it was illegal you know and if you was caught doing it you was be sent to a mental asylum where you'd be be uh bb don't know where that came from you would be lobotomized and cruelly um treated and again very disgusting but um it was very frowned upon you know so you have to imagine female led to a female led story with um homosexual you know scenes and moments it was it, I can understand, like I don't agree with it, but I can understand as to why it was shunned, why it why it was a book that was pushed aside where people didn't um, didn't take it in, you know, didn't appreciate it, kind of push it to one side of like, oh, this 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 book was grotesque and vulgar. Oh no, it's not for us. Oh, uh, the trappings of a mad woman and all this and that, and it was shunned. It was put to one side. It was forgotten. Twenty seven years later, Dracula came out by Bran Stoker and again Dracula male led story so that ticks that box um you know you have the beautiful female you know woman who gets entranced by the uh male lead Dracula again fine you know um it just it just ticked all the boxes for the time and people were like so that's why people remember Dracula but they don't remember Carmilla because Dracula ticked every box that at that time was okay for books, for literature, you know. But I've re I've read Dracula. I read Dracula before I read Carmilla. And I'll be honest, I hated Dracula. It was terrible. You know, I didn't like the book at all. I love the character Dracula in other mediums, but in his origin book, in the book that started it all, I thought it was terrible. I thought it was boring. Uh, it wasn't interesting. You know, we didn't get enough Dracula. The whole person behind the myth the legend we you didn't get enough of him you only got a bit of him you know uh you could even make the argument that there was a um romantic somewhat relationship between um jonathan harker and dracula but because it's so it, it's it's more so like read between the lines sort of thing because it's not really on the nose um you know you could again make the argument that you know people either noticed it but didn't care or didn't notice it at all um so it was never mentioned but <sighs> honestly i read Carmilla recently it's a far better superior book the only downside i have with it it's just too short i wish it was longer i would generally i care more about 
Laura and Carmilla in the few pages that we got than I did in the entire long, huge book that is Dracula. I would rather learn more about, you know, why Carmilla was doing what she was doing, why she needed Laura, why she had, to, she was on this mission to, um, you know, bring in women and kill kill the men, but bring the women back to uh, Carmilla's mother. We never really find out, you know, it, it's a short story, but it's a powerful short story. It's a short story where you're like, I generally care more about Carmilla than I do about Dracula. And you get more Dracula, and Dracula is a mainstay. Dracula is everywhere. You hear more about Dracula than you do Carmilla ever. You know, Dra- Carmilla is like a like a like a little secret. You know that only certain sort of horror fans or um, vampire fa- fans know about, but m- the mainstream don't know about. Her. And I want I'd like to change that. You know, I'd like more people to read Carmilla. So I really recommend it. If you was to, you can find it on Audible. You can find it. Uh, you can probably find a book of it online by Carmilla. It's a short story, and generally, if you've read Dracula, you will enjoy Carmilla more. I don't. It, it, even if you was a big fan of Dracula, I just feel that you would enjoy Carmilla more. It's a better story. It's more interesting. It's shorter. It's sweeter. It's just better, you know. And um, I, I just believe that Carmilla just deserves a lot more love and attention than it ever got when it was first printed, and what it gets today it doesn't get the love it deserves today so that's something that i'd like to change so if i could recommend it i recommend it very highly i rated it five stars on goodreads that's the highest you can rate it on um so i highly recommend it there but that seems to be all of my questions if you have a question if it doesn't matter it can be literature based it could be nerdy it could be um any sort of question at all uh, i would try my best to um, answer it as honestly and as um, straightforward, you know, uh, as I as I can. And um, yeah, you can just set, drop me them on. Uh, yeah, Twitter. Twitter would be the best place. Twitter. Just send me the question. Just put Q and A before it um, at gin, uh, uh, ginger underscore book. Follow me on Twitter, and then just put Q and A quick like Q and A, and then write your question, and I'll write it down, and then I'll answer it here. But um, that's all the questions so let's wrap this quest up and there we go that's the end of our quest that's the end of our adventure i hope that you collected all your loot and that nobody hugged all the loot because we always get them every time you go on a quest there's always that one guy hugs all the loot and then just leaves um so i hope you shared your loot out hope you got the xp you needed got that upgrade you know got that new spell and I hope you enjoyed your adventure here on uh, this first episode of Side Quest. I'm hoping to do more of these in the future. I don't know if they'll be um, every week, but whenever I have a huge um, collection of news or things that I want to talk about, which I don't have time to fit into the main show, um, I'll definitely be doing these. Th- and I, I feel like they're really fun, really enjoyable. You know, it allows me to kind of talk about topics that I just didn't have the time to talk about before, and obviously a little bit extra. You know, so. Yeah, who doesn't love extra things? And it's it's more fun. It's more laid back, more sort of less showy and more well, not that the main show's showy, but you know what I mean. It's it's more more of a good thing. You know, they always say don't have too much of a good thing, but this is only a small thing, so it's okay. <laughs> so I uh, thank you for everybody who, who listened to Side Quest. Um a real, been a real pleasure, real joy, and I hope you see you on the next one. So, as always, stay sexy, stay active. I love you all. Peace. And I hope you all leveled up with SideQuest.